Well, good morning again. I'm so glad that you have uh, chosen to worship with us today. And those that are accompanying mom, we appreciate so much your being here to uh, demonstrate your love uh, to mom today. I know for many moms, uh, the greatest gift for them is to be able to be with their children and to be able to worship with their children. And so we're so glad that uh, you are here today and able to worship with your mom. And we trust the service would, would be a blessing. So as our, as our kids did, our children's ministry did, I was reading this week through notes that boys and girls wrote their mothers on Mother's Day. And I found a few that were just too good to pass up that I kind of wanted to share with you. So this little eight-year-old girl named Angie wrote her mother on Mother's Day and said, Dear Mom, I'm going to make dinner for you on Mother's Day. It's going to be a surprise. (laughs) P.S. I hope you like pizza and popcorn. Um, th- this other little boy said, hey, hey, mom, I got you a turtle this year for Mother's Day. I hope you like it better than the snake that I got you last year. <laughs> this, uh, this little girl said, mom, I hope you like the flowers I got you for Mother's Day. I picked them when the neighbor wasn't looking. <laughs> and then the last one, I love this one, is just short and to the sweet. sweet. Dear mom, Here are two aspirin. Have a happy Mother's Day. (laughs) I think we all would would understand that. It is uh, truly great to be appreciated. And today we demonstrate appreciation for mothers of all kinds. As we mentioned just a few moments ago, we recognize biological mothers, adoptive mothers, foster mothers, motherly mentors, and uh, motherly examples. All of you, in one way or another, have impacted the lives of others. I also recognize that though Mother's Day is a joyous occasion for many of us, for some people, Mother's Day is not the most joyous occasion. I know we have mothers that have, that have lost children, and Mother's Day is a difficult day for them. I know we have other ladies in our congregation that would like to have children, and for one reason or another, they uh, haven't been able to. And we have mothers in our congregation that are estranged from their children. And so whatever your situation is today, we want to we wanna love you, we want to minister to you, and we trust that God's Word will be an encouragement to you. In this morning's message, I would like to show from Scripture that women are not only important to us, and they are important to us, and and men, I trust that you uh, uh, will demonstrate to your mother, to uh, your wives, to the mothers of your children how important that they are to you and to your family. But today we want to demonstrate that women are not only important to us, but that women are also important to God. As a matter of fact, women are so important to God that he has included them in his plan of redemption. Often, uh, we erroneously think that since most of the Bible was written by men, and since men are in much, uh, to much extent, the prominent figures of Scripture, we erroneously think that women do not have a significant role. And that simply is not true. It's not true in the Bible, and it's not true in Christianity today. I was reading this week, and and more than 60% of all believers in the United States are women. In in many congregations, it's it's women who play a, a major role. That's simply the case at Hollywood Community Church as well. HCC could not function were it not for the faithful women who lead, who teach, who administrate, who serve, who use their spiritual gifts. And ladies of Hollywood Community Church, we want you to know today that we applaud you, and we thank the Lord for you, and we want you to know that your role in redemption is significant. I would also add that we have ladies in our church who play a prominent role in our city, who play a prominent role in our community. And so today, ladies, the truth is God has strategically put you in places for the purpose of playing a valuable role in the work of redemption. For the past five months or so, we've been studying the book of Exodus. 
And in our study, we have studied great men that, that, that God raised up to rescue his people and to redeem his people from Egyptian bondage. We've seen how God used Moses, that great man Moses, to, to lead his people out of captivity. We've seen how God used Aaron, Moses' spokesman, to eloquently stand before Pharaoh and speak before Pharaoh. Yet today we must not overlook the vital role played by women in the Exodus story. Without their faithful service, the Exodus, the rescue and the redemption of Israel would never have happened. So today what we want to do is kind of go back a little bit to the story that we have told. And we want to look how God used women to accomplish the redemption of Israel. And we want to look at a couple other women through Scripture that God miraculously and God supernaturally used to accomplish his task. And lastly, we want to look back at, at, at ourselves and say, okay, in this day and age, how can God use us, men and women alike, mothers and fathers alike, how can God use us in the story of redemption? And today, you'll meet one or two women that God is using in a tremendous way, not only here in our community, but around the world. So the first thing that I want us to see, if you have your outline in front of you very simply, is this. Women were extremely involved in the story of the Exodus. And so if you have your Bibles, go all the way back with me to Exodus chapter 1. I know we've already studied this story, but I want to go back and kind of pull out maybe a few details that we uh, overlooked or didn't mention when we first went through the story. So Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. We'll put them up on the screen if you don't have your Bibles in front of you. Verse 15 says, Then the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, said to the Hebrew midwives, verse 16, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women, now let me just pause today because even though there are midwives today, most of us have not used a midwife and we might not be familiar with that term. A, a midwife was a lady who assisted in childbearing. Uh, the midwife would, would cut the child's umbilical cord, wash the baby, and present the child to the mother and the father. So, so, so there in Israel, or, or to the Israelites, while they were in Egypt, there were these midwives who were serving the Israelite women. And so um, it says in verse 16, once again, when you serve as a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool. Let me pause right there because I would venture to say none of us here have used a birth stool. A birth stool is just two rocks, and I'm not going to get any more graphic than that. But let me just say... I can only imagine how uncomfortable it was. And so they delivered. By the way, the, the word that birth stool is used here, those of us that, that love to do word studies, this is the exact same word that's used for potter's wheel later in the Old Testament. I'm not exactly sure how those two correlate, but, but, but a birth stool was something that, that, that a lady would sit on to deliver the baby. That's all the farther I'm going. You can do your own personal study on that, all right? So when you serve as midwives in the Hebrew, of the Hebrew women, see them on the birth stool. If it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. So these, these midwives who were, who were Hebrew women themselves were placed in a very difficult position. Because they were asked, they were commanded by the king, by Pharaoh, that whenever they were in the process of helping a mother deliver, if the baby was a female, to allow it to live. But if it was a male, they were supposed to kill the baby. Verse 17 says this, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let each male child live. Man, I read that and I thought, wow, that these midwives possessed a fear of God so great that it led them to disobey a royal order by the king, by Pharaoh himself, to kill all of the male children. Their, their fear of God was stronger than their fear of Pharaoh. It was stronger than their fear of uh, what the Egyptian government could do to them. 
And we find in the passage that as a result of their obedience, as a result of their faith, as a result of them fearing God, that God blessed them. In verse 20 of this chapter, it says this, so God dwelt well with the midwives. And verse 21 says this, he gave them families of their own. So the very first thing, first thing we see is these Hebrew midwives acted with courage and did not kill the male babies. I paused and I would say this to our ladies in attendance today, and obviously it would apply to the men in attendance as well. Today, we need men and women with the same level of courage. Women and men who fear God above anything else. Men and women who understand that it is better to obey God than it is man. So mothers and ladies, I would encourage you today, place your fear of God, your reverence for God, your obedience to God above anyone or anything else. That's what we see in the first chapter of Exodus. Go with me to Exodus chapter 2. In the first three verses, we're introduced to another woman. Exodus chapter 2 and verse 1, now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes, daubed it with bitumen and pitch, and she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. It's interesting to note that all of the people in this narrative are anonymous. Their, their names are not mentioned. We know from later scripture reading that the man's name was Amram and the woman's name was Jochebed. These are Moses' parents. Now, like most mothers, Jochebed, when, when, when her baby was born, her, in, her, her maternal intuition kicked in. And she wanted to do everything she possibly could to save her child. What, what mother doesn't sacrifice everything for her children? That's what Jochebed did. She did what every mother would do. She, she fought for the life of her child. And the text says very simply that when he was born, she, she hid him. She hid him for three months. But when it was no longer possible to hide his cries, and there's some uh, debate as to why the three-month period, something that, that the Egyptian soldiers did a tour every three months to see if they could find any male babies. Other think, others think that, that by three months, his lungs had grown and become stronger, and so his cries were so loud that she could no longer hide him. But at three months old, she realized that she would have to do something else or she would be discovered. Her baby boy would be discovered. And so we find that she did something very interesting in the text. And I simply put in your notes this, Jochebed, Moses' mother, demonstrated creativity in devising a plan to save her son. Verse 3 tells us that when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made from bulrushes. The word basket here is a really interesting word, and you might sit back and say, I don't understand what it is, but you do understand what it is because the same word has been used in Scripture. As a matter of fact, it's used only one other time in Scripture. It's used in Genesis chapter 6 through Genesis chapter 8. And in Genesis 6 through 8, the word is not translated basket, it's translated ark. It's the exact same word that is used to describe the big boat, the big ship that Noah built to rescue his family. And so the idea in the passage is really cool is that, is that just as Noah built an ark to rescue his family, so Jochebed built an ark, a small little boat, as it were, to save and rescue baby Moses. I sat there and read that and I think, man, how cool is that? 
The use of this word, though, uh, not only shows that God was acting just to save little baby Moses or that God was acting just to save the nation of Israel, but we see in this small act of Jochebed being used by God to create this little basket, this little ark, that God was using her and that God would use her son to redeem all of creation. God would use Moses and God would use Israel to accomplish that. The description of the boat, and we don't have a lot of time to go into it, but the description of the boat is is interesting. She uses materials that were frequently used to build small Egyptian boats. There is also some indication that it was made from material that would have protected him from a crocodile attack. Can you imagine, I mean, to have that in your mind, all of a sudden you, you have this baby that you love, that you've cared for for three months, it's your own flesh and blood, and you don't want to give this baby up, but you're scared to be caught, and so you come up with this creative idea to create a boat, and you place that little one in a boat, and you want to protect him from the crocodiles in the river, you want to protect him from everything that he could possibly face, not knowing what the future held but entrusting him into the hands and into the providence of an almighty God. That's what Jacobet did. She had done everything that she could in protecting her son. So she comes up with a creative idea to maybe even spare his life for a few more days, maybe until she could come up with another plan, or maybe until God could rescue him. And so she places her son in this little ark and entrusts him to the providence of God. Let me pause because there's a great lesson there for parents. Because as parents, we can only do what we can do with our kids, right? We can't live their lives for them. And as parents, it's our job to train them up in the way of the Lord, the way of God's word. But there comes a point in our life where we have to take our hands off and we have to entrust our children to the providence of God. That's what Jochebed does. And the Bible lifts her up as an example to us, as an example to women. Notice verse four of this chapter. And then his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Verse 5, now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while, she, while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket. So here is Pharaoh's daughter who comes down to bathe in the Nile River. And as she's bathing in the Nile River, maybe she hears the voice, the cries of this little one. Maybe she just looks out and sees this, this unique archetype basket. Whatever it is, whatever draws her attention to it, she notices the, uh, the ark. And so she sends her servant women, her servant women to take it. Verse six, when she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. So so our third woman in the story is Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter responds with compassion in adopting Moses. It's interesting, there is... There seems to be in the text a play on the word daughter in the passage. Let me just kind of show you real quick, and then those who love to investigate can investigate later. If you go back to chapter 1 and verse 22, we find after the midwives wouldn't kill the children, Pharaoh makes this edict to everybody in Egypt. Verse 22, then Pharaoh commanded all his people, not just the midwives, now he commanded all of his people, every son born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile. So he makes this edict across all of Egypt. If you see a male child, do not let him live. We should kill all the male children. But chapter one ends with this phrase, but you shall let every daughter live. Now it's interesting because then starting chapter two, the word daughter is found five times in the next paragraph. And amazingly, it is Pharaoh's own daughter who rescues Moses. It's not any Egyptian woman, but it's Pharaoh's own daughter who rescues Moses. 
What a fascinating development in the story. The boy who Pharaoh so desperately wanted to kill would be raised in the palace of the king. The boy that that Pharaoh wanted to do away with would be raised right under his nose, as it were. As I read that, I sit back and think, man, what a God twist to the story. I mean, not only would God raise up a redeemer, not only would God save a little boy to redeem his people, but that little boy that God would miraculously save would grow up in the very house of the man who was trying to kill him and all of the other male babies. What a God twist. Something that only God can do. Uh, Let me ask you, I wrote in my notes as I prayed through this passage, I wrote, have I ever had a God twist in my life? Have you ever had a God twist in your life? Situations and circumstances that can only be explained by the sovereignty of God. And I would encourage you with the thought today that just as Moses was important enough to God for God to save him, and just as Jochebed was important enough for God, for God to work in the life of that family, you and your children are important to God. And if we ever just sit back and pause for a moment and reflect, we can see God at work in our life as well. And I'd venture to say that there have been God twists in your life, circumstances and situations which have occurred in your life that can only be explained by the sovereignty of God. We see that here in this passage. Notice verses 7 through 10. So, so Pharaoh's daughter sends one of her servants to go and pick up the basket and to bring the baby, little Moses. Of course, he wasn't named Moses then, but bring little Moses back to her, verse seven. Then his sister, Moses' sister, unnamed in the passage, we believe that she's Miriam, who later on would be of great influence to the nation of Israel. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. The fourth little statement that I drew from this passage is this, that Miriam, Moses' sister, cunningly suggested that Moses' mother care for him until he was older. It's interesting, Jewish tradition, the Talmud states that, that Pharaoh's daughter tried to get several Egyptian ladies to nurse him, but they were unable to nurse him. And when they demonstrated their inability to nurse this newfound baby, Miriam was in the right place and the right time asking the question, do you want me to go and find a Hebrew woman to nurse this child for you? So I read through this, I was reminded of another characteristic of God that you and I can apply to our lives very simply as this. God not only answers our prayers, but he often gives us more than we ask for. Think about that here in this case. Jochebed's desire, all she wanted was her son to live. And as she placed him in the water, she never believed that he would come back to her. Her cry, no doubt to God, as she placed that little ark in the water was, God, protect my son. I am entrusting him to you. God, please allow my son to live. And what did God do? God not only spared Moses' life, But he allowed Moses' own mother to nurse him and care for him the first few years of his life. 
Isn't that a God thing, how God does that? And on top of all that, she was paid for doing it. I mean, she was able to nurse and to mother her own child. And the king, Pharaoh, paid her to take care of her own son. Isn't that just like God? God comes in, we ask God to do something for us, and God gives us not only what we ask for, but God often, not always, but God often gives us more than we ask for. I'm reminded of the words in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 that says, God is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or than we think. Uh, Sometimes, quite honestly, our view of God is so small that we only ask God for small things. God, God, if you'll just do this one little thing for me in God's plan for you, God's plan for me is larger than our own imagination. And God comes through. And God not only answers our prayer, but God gives us more than we ask, more than we could ever think. Those are God moments in your life. I would encourage you whenever those God moments happen in your life to write them down, to remember them because we are so prone to forget the great things that God has done for us and we have a tendency to remember the times that we wanted him to do something and for some reason he didn't act the way we wanted him to act. There are God moments in your life and in mine when God demonstrates his power. So here in the book of Exodus, Here's what we see. We see that God used four women to help accomplish the story of redemption. We can only ask what if, but what if the midwives had not stepped up and done their part and spared all the little baby boys? What if Jochebed had succumbed to a oh well mentality and had given up her own child? What if Pharaoh's daughter had not been moved with compassion and rescued that little baby in the ark? What if Miriam had not been looking, observing, looking out for her little brother and suggesting, hey, my mom, or I know somebody who can take care of that baby. God used each and every one of these women in a remarkable way so that the rest of the story of Exodus is able to be played out according to God's plan. And so in the book of Exodus, we see God using extraordinary women to accomplish his plan of redemption. Let me just pause and say this. That's not only true in the book of Exodus, but throughout all of Scripture, we find God using extraordinary women to accomplish his story of redemption. Let me give you three. I'll mention them quickly today, and then I kind of want to pull it together in a real practical way this morning. First of all, we find that Rahab in the book of Joshua was used by God to protect the Jewish spies. If you're not familiar with the story, you can read it in, in, in Joshua chapter 2 and Joshua chapter 3, but Rahab was a Canaanite prostitute who lived in the city of Jericho. And before the Israelites came in to conquer the city of Jericho, if you've read the Old Testament, you read the book of Joshua, you know the story, they sent out spies, and Rahab protected those spies. She protected them before the city was conquered. James chapter two and verse 25 tells us that at that moment she, was, she believed, and James says because of her belief, she was justified. If you read through the story, you find that as a result of her belief, as a result of her actions, her entire family was protected. And so when the Israelites came in and they conquered the city of Jericho, there was one family that was saved. There was one part of the city wall which did not collapse. What part was that? That was the part where Rahab lived. And all of her household who were in that part of the wall were spared. So here's what the writer of Hebrews tells us about Rahab. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, or yeah, Hebrews 11, 1, let me find it, 11, 31, it says this, by faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, 
because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. So, so, so I, I want you to see as we move through Scripture, we not only see God using men to accomplish his plan of redemption, but we see God using women to accomplish his plan of redemption as well. Another Old Testament example is that of Ruth. There's a book written about her, the book of Ruth, only four chapters. Ruth was a foreigner from Moab who had married a Jewish husband. And when he unexpectedly died, Ruth was forced to make a decision. Would she go back to the religion of her youth? Would she go back to her former pagan way of life? Or would she stay with her new family? Would she worship Yahweh, the God of her husband? Husband of her husband's family. If you read through the book of Ruth, you see that she chose to stay with Naomi, her mother-in-law, and she chose to demonstrate her faith in Yahweh God. And the story of Ruth basically is this, because of her faithfulness, God blessed her with a husband, a man by the name of Boaz. I simply wrote in your notes, by faith, Ruth married Boaz and became an ancestor of Jesus Christ. So here's this lady who grew up in a pagan home, a Moabite. She wasn't even Jewish. She grew up in a pagan home. She married a Jewish man who uh, unexpectedly dies. And she, by faith, doesn't return to her pagan way of life, but by faith, she embraces Yahweh, the God of Israel. As a result of that, God blesses her, gives her a new husband, and that's not the end of the story. She becomes a progenitor, an ancestor of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, let me show you a verse in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5. You'll see both of these ladies mentioned. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5, this is the genealogy of Jesus. And Salmon, the father of Boaz, Ruth's husband, or excuse me, yeah, yeah, and Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, the first lady we mentioned, and Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth, the second lady we mentioned, and Obad, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. So both of these ladies, we would say unworthy, are used by God in the story of redemption. They become ancestors of King David and eventually ancestors of none other than Jesus Christ himself. A third example that I would give, and there's many more that we could give, is by faith, Mary became the mother of the Messiah. Could you imagine being a young teenage girl? There's speculation how old Mary was, 15, 16 years old, when all of a sudden you have an encounter with an angel who looks at you and says, God has chosen you to be his vessel. God has chosen you to be his servant. God wants you to be the mother of the Messiah. What a daunting task. How would you respond to that responsibility? Luke chapter 1 and verse 38 tells us how Mary responded. Luke 1, 38, and Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to, to your word. And the angel departed from her. So we find in the book of Exodus that God used ladies in the redemption story. All throughout the Old Testament, and time prohibits us to talk about other wonderful ladies throughout Scripture that God used in the redemption story. All of those are wonderful truths, wonderful stories, but here's what I want us to catch today. And I want our ladies in the audience to catch this, and I want our men to catch it as well. Like the women of the Bible, God desires to use you in his redemption story. Let me say that again, because sometimes we look at Scripture as just old, ancient stories. God worked that way in the Old Testament. God worked that way in the New Testament. I'm not sure how that's how God responds today. But let me declare to you today that just as God used these women to accomplish His redemption story, ladies, God desires to use you in His redemption story today. 
Maybe not in the exact same way. He's certainly not looking for another Virgin Mary. But he is looking for someone like yourself who would step up and say, okay, God, you've placed me in the situations and circumstances where I am. Help me to be used by you in the story of redemption. You see, redemption is not just an Old Testament event. Redemption is not just a New Testament occurrence. God today still rescues and redeems his people. As a matter of fact, I would pause and say this. God desires for your story to be a story of redemption. God desires for, for, for you to rescue or to, to realize your need of him and allow him to come into your life and to rescue you from the bondage of sin and to redeem you and give you the life that only he can give. If you're here today and your life has never been changed by the power of the gospel, I would challenge you with the thought today that there's a God in heaven who loves you more than you could ever imagine, who desires to have a personal relationship with you, and that is the reason why he sent Jesus Christ into the world, so that he, paying the price for our sins, might open the door so that we might have a relationship with God. And I trust that you have that relationship today. Three thoughts, and I want to kind of flesh this out in a practical way today. But I would say this, you sit back and say, okay, Brian, how in the world can I be involved in the redemption story? Three ways. First of all, realize that your dependence upon the gospel will point others to Jesus Christ. Your dependence on the gospel will point others to Jesus Christ. Yesterday we had the the memorial service for Bill Wallace. And my, how we miss Bill. Bill was known as the parking lot guy here at Hollywood Community Church. And, and Bill was unique in so many different ways. But Bill, if nothing else, was the example of a man whose life was changed by the power of the gospel. You see, there was an old Bill and there was a new Bill. There was a bill before Jesus and there was a bill after he came to know Jesus. But Bill realized in his life each and every day that he needed the power of the gospel. We shared these verses from Romans chapter 7, which is is the testimony of Paul. Paul says this, I know that nothing good lives in me and that that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Oh, what a miserable person I am who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. So even Paul realized this uh, this eternal struggle in which all of us live, the desire to do right, but at the same time this battle that is going on within our lives, this desire to do wrong that we have, and this eternal struggle, this spiritual conflict that is going on within each and every one of us. And Paul sat back and said, my word, who is going to deliver me from this battle that I am facing? Those are powerful words. All of us can relate with Paul's words. Life is a struggle, but there's hope because in verse 25, Paul says this, thank you, God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So I pause and say this, moms, biological moms, adoptive moms, foster moms, mother figures, you know how you can be used in the story of redemption? You can be used in the story of redemption by simply conveying the truth, by demonstrating the power of the gospel in and through your life each and every day. I shared with our folks in our service yesterday that I am where I am today in a very real sense because there was a godly lady in my life, my mother who not only spoke the truth of the gospel, but who lived out the truth of the gospel each and every day. And she lived in such a way that she pointed me to Jesus. Realize that your dependence on the gospel will point others to Jesus Christ. Let me share a second way. Realize that your compassionate 
service can change the life of others. God desires to use you to impact the life of others. Let me introduce you to a lady from our church today. I'm gonna ask Jackie. Jackie, would you, would you come up here for a second? This is Jackie Pilecki from Hollywood Community Church. Come on up, Jackie. Come and sit down right here. I'm gonna put you right here at this chair right here. Thank you. I'm gonna give you this microphone. The microphone's on. Have a seat, Jackie. So, Jackie has a powerful story. And Jackie is being used in a great way in the story of redemption. Jackie's not a preacher. She's not a pastor. She's not a ministry leader. But I'd venture to say that God has used Jackie as much as he's used anybody else in our congregation. So Jackie, would you kind of share with our congregation what it is that, that, that you feel your calling is and what it is that, that, that you have done? Okay, I've known ever since I was a small child that my calling would be to help children. Children all need to be loved and I had so much love to give them. And I just knew from, from the beginning of time that that was what I was gonna be doing. Mm -hmm. I started doing foster care in the early 70s. I was a single mom trying to finish college and I was struggling quite a bit and I thought, you know, maybe helping a couple kids out would help my kids and help them. So I ended up, I think, fostering maybe in my whole life. I'm not doing foster care now. My kids are adopted and I've retired. I think I've had more than 70 some kids come in and out of my house. Okay, let's just pause right there. I wanna make sure you caught that. How many kids have you fostered? At least 70. At least yeah. 70 kids. Wow. Yeah. This is a lady who much of that time was a single parent. Yeah. Fostering these kids. Yeah. But I knew that God wanted me to do this. I just, it was just always in my heart since, since I could even remember. I would dress my dolls up and they would be my children. I would pretend I had How many orphanage. dolls did you foster before you? I don't even remember. Probably more animals than dolls, actually. <laughs> so, so, Jackie, share with us, because I guarantee you there's people out in our congregation that have sat back and thought, boy, that'd be really cool to foster a child, but I'm not sure I could do that. And so what are some of the challenges that you've faced in the... 30 plus years that you've been fostering children. Well, I started out fostering teenage girls. So the biggest challenge there was trust. Most of them were either runaways or throwaways. And it was either succeed with me or go to juvenile detention. Wow. And because of the problems that they had, like with abuse, neglect, mothers and fathers that were alcoholics, so many terrible things had happened to them. They were just so afraid. They didn't want to trust any adults. Mm. And I was in my 20s then, so maybe I was close enough that I could get through to them. And I made it a point that we prayed. We prayed constantly. And I told them the only way that they can just get over these fears that they were fearing was through God, because mm. God is the only thing that can keep you safe in this world. Wow. There's no, you can't run to child protective services and get protected, because they knew that. They knew that that was the truth. Child protective services is there to help, but there's a certain time where you go back to the situation you were in. But with God, he was always there, no matter what situation you were in and who you were with. and what was around you, you could always pray. Well, you not only fostered teenage girls, but, but you fostered a lot of teenage boys as well, did you not? I had some teenage boys, not as many. When I got a little older, I think when I was in my 20s, it was not a good thing. But in my 30s and 40s, yeah, I had teenage boys too. Wow. And then I adopted uh, my first baby 
I think I was in my 40s when I had the first baby, and he was HIV positive, and that was a challenge, whether wow. I could handle this. Yeah. And the funny thing is, his mother was my first foster child. Wow. So I feel really like So there's honored. like a generational thing Yeah, right there. I felt almost like his grandmother. Wow. <laughs> but it was really wonderful. And he's, he's a godly man now. He's 25. He's living in Texas. Mm. He's doing well with his health. And thank you. So, so Jackie, what are, what are um, some ways that God has helped you? Because we're talking about living out the truth of the gospel and just using our talents, our time to be able to serve him. So, so what are some ways that God has, has helped you to be able to confront some of these challenges? There's a couple little words that's helped me more than anything. It's be still. Be still. Be still is the biggest. Mm. There's so many times I felt like my whole world was just going to explode around me. There was so much going on and I didn't think I could handle it. But then I would go and just be still. And I'd hear that small voice. Mm. And it would give me such strength. And I knew that God was there with me. And that he was never going to give me more than I could handle. Wow. And he always kept me humble. Not thinking that I could take on the world. Just mm. deal with what I had at the moment. What's the most children that you ever fostered at one time? Four babies, all under 18 months old. Oh my word. <laughs> that was the biggest. Where's Dr. Hill? He could do that. He could do that. <laughs> Two of the babies were HIV positive. One of the babies was a newborn. Mm. So I would often have to go to the clinic with the kids. And sometimes I would have to take public transportation. And that was God's way of humbling me. Mm. <laughs> Try to get on a bus with four babies. Oh my word. So, but he often and most often gave me angels to help me. Mm. Like I would get to the clinic ready to lose my mind. You know, I had one tied with a leash one on the front of me in a baby pouch, one by my hand, one holding onto my belt loop, you know, just struggling to hang on to these kids. And I would always seem to have someone at the door to help me. Wow. There would always be an angel there. It's like God was walking yeah, ahead of yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. And he you was like, you can way. do this, you can do this. Wow. You know, and I always knew that it would just happen and it would be good. And because the two, the, the brothers were HIV positive, sometimes the clinic would send me home in a cab because the pharmaceutical companies give them some monies, mm -hmm. you know, for services. So they would send me home in a cab. By the end of that time, I was ready to So kind of like that. a God chariot to take you home <laughs> afterward. Yes, so, really. So Jackie, as you look out at a congregation our size, so what are, what are some words of wisdom that you would share with us. So, so as you look back over your experience, what's something that you could say to encourage all of us here today? Never be afraid. Never mm -hmm. be afraid to listen to what God has for you to do. Wow. Because no matter what medical condition you're in, how much strength you have, how much time you have, there's always time to to do your work that God gives you. Wow. Yeah, Jackie, God always. bless you. We are, we are so proud of you. And we're so proud that you're a part of Hollywood Community Church. Can we let her know how much we appreciate her today? <laughs> yeah. God bless you. I'm gonna give you a hug. I'm proud of you so much. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. I know that. Pray for her. you can be seated. Pray for Jackie. She has multiple sclerosis now. So on top of all of that, she's struggling with multiple sclerosis. So when I, when I called Jackie this week, and out of the blue, she had no idea we were going to do this. I called her, I think, on Thursday, and I said, "Hey, Jackie, I'd just like to interview you and and you tell your story to our people." Her response was this: 
okay, I just don't think there's anything special about me or anything special about my story. And I said, I said, Jackie, that's exactly why you're special. Now, now, now here's my challenge to you. God is using Jackie in his redemption story. Nothing special about Jackie. And, and when I say that, she knows we think the world of her and we admire her and God's given her the grace and ability. But there's nothing extraordinary that sets her apart from you. The only difference is she sat back and said, okay, God's placed me here for a purpose. I want my life to count for something. I want to be used in God's story of redemption. And God's used her in the lives of more than 70 kids. Let me tell you about one other lady today and then I'll be done. Becky Schroeder is part of the Sheltering Wings team in Burkina Faso. Had the opportunity to meet Becky last year for the very first time before she ever went to Burkina Faso. When we were there just a few months ago, uh, we were able to meet her. Since that time, God has brought, as he does, he brings disabled children into the orphanage. And, and many parents are unable to take care of their kids, so they come and just drop their children off at the orphanage. I think about three weeks ago, a mother came and brought a child by, I'm not gonna pr- try to pronounce his name in more, they call him Bear, Baby W. But uh, Baby W is 10 months old, He weighs 5.8 pounds at 10 months old. His legs are completely deformed. He has microcephaly, which is a medical condition in which his brain does not develop properly, resulting in a smaller head than normal. For the past two or three weeks, Becky has dedicated almost all of her time, 24 hours a day, to take care of this little one. We have no idea how long he's going to live. Right now we're praying that a family in the States would adopt him. But Becky is stepping up to the plate, saying I wanna be used in God's story of redemption. You see, so many times we make a big deal, and, and we should, about Mother's Day, you know, just being, you know, about biological mothers. But in both of these cases, we have ladies who stepped up and, 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 and Becky's not a biological mother, I believe Jackie is, but have stepped up and said, I wanna do something beyond that. And I wanna make a difference in the kingdom of God using simply my time, my talents, and my abilities. Here's my challenge to you today, ladies and men alike. God wants to use you in his story of redemption. God wants to use you to impact the lives of others. It's simply sitting back saying, okay, God, here I am, use me. One final way, realize that your prayers will accomplish much. James says this, the effective prayer of righteous people accomplishes much. I'm so grateful that God redeemed me. I'm so grateful that God has rescued me. But the challenge for us is not just to sit back and glory in our rescue, to glory in our redemption, but to sit back and say, okay, God, how can I be used in redeeming others? How can I be used in rescuing others? Your story will be different than Jackie's story. Your story will be different than Becky's story. Your story is different than my story. But the simple fact is this, God desires to use you. Will you allow him to do so?